Hey there, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani in the house. Evan Brand, how are we doing today? Hey man, I'm doing great. I'm super refreshed. I was so jealous of you getting out on your boat all the time. So I finally got to get out on the boat myself and I had a blast. I mean, when you're out on the water and all you see are trees and blue sky and the reflections on the water, that's a very recharging thing to do. Oh, it totally is recharging, especially you get some fresh air, a little vitamin D. Maybe you do uh, some cold thermogenesis too, get in the water where it's a little cold. I jumped in. It felt great. We saw tons of different birds. I mean, I brought my binoculars out on the boat, so we were just looking at all sorts of birds. We saw an osprey bomb dive and catch a fish. That was really wow. cool. That's cool. Do you know if you're swimming in lake water like that, does that have, does that have a grounding effect, like, like going barefoot on the uh, front I'm grass? Sure. I'm sure it yeah. does. I mean, there was no electricity. It's not like you're swimming in a, a pool that's hooked up to a big water pump or something. You know, that's about as primal environment as you can get. That's great. Excellent. I, I see you got some. I, I feel really good. That's good to hear. I see you got some weights behind you. you you've been lifting some weights recently. You're looking uh, a little bigger. Wow. Uh, well, you know, those those are those are the same weights back there that I've had. I just moved my desk around. But uh, but yes, I have been lifting more, and luckily, no pain. No no pain. I'm 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 back into the to the weights without trouble. Good. I got to get back a little bit more into lifting. Like my big movement is I've been doing a couple of Tabatas a week and then I've been getting like the last three days, 15,000 steps per day, the last three days. So I'm getting on, you know, about 45 to 50 miles a week of walking. That's insane. So yeah. I mean, it's nice. And I got my little treadmill desk. Uh, well, treadmills up here. And then I have my little stepper that I do a lot of, you know, maybe three to 5,000 steps there. And if I'm like, if I'm feeling a little bit more aggressive at night, I'll, I'll put it up in front of the TV and do some steps while watching TV is too. Oh, one update I do have for people. I did get an aura ring. I do not have oh, it yes. on, but I did get the ring and I do put it on airplane mode at night and I've been tracking my sleep at night. And I think it's kind of silly overall just to track your sleep and that's it. So what I'm trying to do is I'm going to start experimenting with certain adaptogenic herbs and certain protocols and see if I can change the amount of deep sleep, if I can change the amount of REM sleep that I get. So for example, maybe I take ashwagandha, maybe a little bit of GABA and then see what happens. Do I get 20 minutes extra deep sleep by doing that? Or do I get more REM sleep? I want to see how do herbs change the sleep rhythm. I think that's smart, man. I mean, I'm going to take some of my herbs right now here to get my adrenals primed and ready for a long week. But I think things like that are great because it's not only the perception is taking adaptogens help you perceive stress better because input comes in and then you don't feel as jazzed up or as kind of the spider senses are tingling because it allows you to interpret that stress um, a little bit better so you're not as wound up. And then yeah. of course, you know, just having good healthy habits to go to like movement, um, like exercise, like prayer, meditation, or visualization, having those kind of techniques, I think there as another way to take that energy or stress and, and kind of channel it, I think is also great. Yeah. The other thing too, that I'm interested in is to see exactly, uh, how like the blue blocking glasses mm -hmm. help me like is my, because it also tracks your heart rate variability and it also tracks your resting heart rate and you can see your resting heart rate drop towards the middle of the night. So I'm curious to see, okay, Hey, if I blasted myself with some light before bed, did that actually impact anything? We know that it does, but it's going to be good to be able to quantify stuff. Totally. Like myself, I notice if I have a little bit of dark chocolate before bed, I get a little rev, like dark That's chocolate true. for me has some, has some very good cognitive benefits. I am very focused. I'm very alert. I'm not overly stimulated, but I definitely have this kind of steady energy. So I do notice if I'm trying to get to bed earlier, I either do less or I just, you know, don't do anything. So I'm, I'm moving like my snacks towards like a uh, almond butter, green apple with some cinnamon as a kind of a snack. So I'm kind of shifting my snacks a little bit, but uh, I still, I find that if I do a blue blocking glasses, like my Swannies, it does like make me tired. Like I just get tired really fast. I'm like, whoa. That's a good sign. Yeah, I've got these little yellow ones here. We were talking about flicker from screens. I won't put them on here because I'll look silly with the reflection, but these little yellow ones, they've been doing me pretty good. So I'm gonna keep testing them and I'll report back to people. Cause it's like, hey, look, we don't want people to not enjoy modern life and technology, but there's a good totally. way and a smart way to do it. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. And I know we um, were chatting before the show. We were just talking about you know the investment that we're making into our monitors, right? We both are all about. We have the 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 flicker free monitors along with the low blue light. So this allows us to be working with our patients and have all this technology, uh, so we don't you know deleteriously affect our health. So That's we're trying to find technology that allows us to perform well but also be functional. 
Yeah, I mean, Dr. Mercola, he, you know, basically made fun of himself when I talked with him because he was using a 50 inch TV, 50 inch TV, blasting himself with blue light and flicker, et cetera. And then he gets on this whole EMF rabbit hole. And now I don't know what he's using now, but I'm guessing it's not that TV anymore. Yeah, the problem with the TVs is number one, they aren't, you aren't designed to be that close to them. So if right. you're that close, you're getting a ton of that. And I don't think they have like the low blue light, low flicker TV stuff. I know they have it for monitors because people have the eye strain issues because they're so close. So I think going with the monitors, like I'm on a ViewSonic that's got a, a, a no flicker, low blue light, which is great. And I know we talked about you. You're going to be testing the ViewSonic, the new ViewSonic, as well as the, what's the other brand? The other one is BenQ. BenQ. So if anyone here is on monitors or needs them for work and stuff, really look at a good external monitor that has the low flicker light as well as the um, low blue light. So I'll put a link to the ones that I have. I have three big 30 inch ones and then my laptop monitor. So four technically, but I usually only use just the three external ones and they work phenomenally. That's awesome. So what we kind of chatted about, and then of course we can go into other topics, but we get a lot of questions about kids. Now that the kids are back in school at the time we're talking and towards the end of September here, a lot of moms are saying, Hey, look, my kids got these symptoms. Like they're complaining of tummy aches. What should I be doing to investigate my child's health? And the question is great. It's really not that different than what you would do with an adult. But I think there are some important things that we can talk about that are a little different for kids in terms of gut health. So let's dive into this. Absolutely. And I, you know, myself, I have a 13 month year old child, you have a, a two year old child. So we have kids, we know what it's like, we're in the trenches. So we're talking about it from a place of empathy. I think when you have kids, you have to have like your non negotiables, right? Like my kids not going to whine to the point where I say, Okay, okay, Aiden, you know, you don't have to wear your seatbelt in the car today, right? Or hey, when you go on your bike, you don't have to wear your helmet when you're on your bike, right? These are like non-negotiables, I'd say for 99.9% .9 of parents. But it's amazing though, those non-negotiables, for me, I have certain foods that are non-negotiable, right? So I have non-negotiable foods, but how parents will negotiate with foods and then those foods become a habit, right? So with my son, Aiden, he drinks, he doesn't do a ton of green vegetables, right? There's a little bit, but what's the substitute? Well, we do green juice. So he does spinach, kale, celery and cucumber and uh, parsley and basil, and it's all ground up in a green juice, no added sugar. So he's got a little bit of green juice. He'll do a little bit of sweet potato. He loves his berries. He will ro rotate between blueberry, raspberry, strawberry, and blackberry. And we noticed that he had a, some would start to come out in his stool after a period of time. So we just rotate between those. And then he has his various meats, pork, you know, pork, chicken, fish, and then some egg yolks. And then of course we have like a couple of starches, squash, sweet potatoes, and then we try to get some veggies in there when possible, like cut up broccoli, broccolini in thin strips, sauteed in, in, in um, butter with some sea salt, and then we'll do the green juice. So we kind of, we are able to figure out what the substitute is so we can get some more greens in, but it's a non-negotiable. Yep. And we just celebrated his um, birthday recently. We had two birthdays for him. Um, one with his other family, with uh, my wife's side of the family, so they could be there. And we got him this organic, gluten-free cake, and he took one bite of it and threw it on the ground. That's awesome. Right? <laughs> and it's because this is what I try to get a hold of my parents that I, that I coach that have kids. It's that kids' taste buds reset. Yes. And they become less sensitive. And then when you pound them with sugar, it's like, whoa, it's like you're used to like watching stuff on your TV. And now you're going into a movie theater with huge speakers and surround sound and subwoofer. You're like, whoa, okay, this is overwhelming. So it's kind of like that. But the thing is, so if kids are eating a whole bunch of sugar and now that's being pulled out, their taste buds are kind of like have to down regulate. It's like, okay, you're in the concert, lots and lots of music, lots and lots of speakers. Then you come home. And it's like, everything sounds like a whisper. So their taste buds are just under stimulated and it will take a couple of weeks for those taste buds to reset. Now, the big thing you can do is we can make sure zinc is present. We can make sure good quality essential fatty acids are present. We can supplement with cod liver oil, right? We can, we can use um, smoothies where we provide a little bit of sweetness with some berries or maybe add some monk fruit or stevia to get some of those nutrients or collagen amino acids in there. So we just got to make sure like, all right, what are our non-negotiables? Let's make sure we prioritize food. Food is really important. I think parents 
most parents get lulled into it because if their kids watch TV or if they go to you know other kids' houses, most parents don't prioritize it. So it's easy to get them sucked in and then they want it because remember, these foods are designed to be addicting. So once your kids are addicted, they're going to be on you to feed them. So you have to do your best to kind of create the shelter. And remember, your kid's palate in the first five years of their life, that's where their taste buds and their palates form. So you don't have to be perfect till they're 18. You just really have to give them those first couple of years up to age five. You really form that palate. And then their taste are going to be dialed in. And then you're going to have that kind of effect like my son had where he took the cake, threw it on the ground because it was just too much for him, right? So just yeah. – you know, we don't got to be perfect, but you just got to have, all right, what are the goals? And then find the healthy substitutes. Like I'm still going to give my kid some cake on his birthday because, you know, he's a kid. I want him to have those experiences, but we found healthier substitutes, right? Find the substitute. You don't have to take away your kid's experience, but you can just find the healthier versions. Yeah. And even if you have to make something and you can't find store-bought, I mean, there's like grain-free cookies. There's grain-free cakes. I've seen some, there's a brand, I think it's called Simple Mill or simple mills with an S, but they have grain free options like almond flour cookies. And it's like less than one gram of sugar per cookie. Awesome. Like for instance, my wife and I over the weekend, we had pizza. What do we have? We got the cauliflower crust and then we just have some organic tomato pizza sauce. And then I have some almond cheese that has coconut oil in it, no bad fats. So we just do, here's the crust already pre-bought. We just spread some tomato sauce on it got some almond cheese. We cooked up some grass fed meat and laid it on top, cooked it for 10 minutes. It's out. And we had a phenomenal meal. I'm going to have to buy that. My wife's been wanting pizza super bad. So I'm going to have to. Oh yeah. That. Yeah. I mean, you can get, I think it's California, California, okay. kind of a little play on ca cauliflower in California. And they have great pizza crust, very low carb, organic nutrient dense. And then you just can get, if you want the cheese, just there's some pretty decent almond cheeses out there that taste really good. And, um, just got to look at the ingredients in the back. Some have canola oil, some have junky fats in it, some don't. So you just got to look at it and see which ones make the most sense. And where'd you and find you, the crust at? That was Whole Foods? We Yeah, Whole Foods has it. You can order it online as well. I think Capello's also has one as well. And then you can figure out what you like. They do have a nice cassava tapioca one that's very good. It's it's like kind of like um, it's really stiff and kind of hard. So it gives you that a little bit more body to it. But it's nice. So you can you can do these things. You can you can have the experience. You can give your kids the experience without all the side effects. That's I mean, that's the best part of it, too. It's like they get made fun of so much already for bringing a healthy lunch to school. You know, we talk with these moms and their kid gets bullied because they brought a lunchbox and they had like an organic apple and all the other kids are drinking chocolate milk at school, which is high fructose corn syrup and a bunch of other garbage. And if the kid yeah. does it, they come on with the tummy ache. Now, I think the diet piece was great. Let's chat about infections in kids. I mean, this is very, very common. I've already tested my daughter's stool twice. She's two years old, but I've already tested her gut twice just to be sure what's going on. And she did have some bacterial overgrowth that we did use some herbs to address. And her gut and her poops are awesome. They got a little bad. So we thought something was weird, tested it, showed up with yeah. Klebsiella. She had Klebsiella overgrowth and then something else. I don't remember what it was, maybe Streptococcus or something. But we did get rid of it and retest to confirm. And uh, I see infections in one-year-old, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, five-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 20-year-olds. I mean – these bugs don't discriminate based on your age. That's for sure. Totally. Just to highlight one more thing before we dive into that, because you brought up a great point, is that as a parent, um, it's really important. Don't project what you what you think your kid needs. I see a lot of parents that um, they project like a lot. It's been so ingrained in our society that part of a kid being a kid is them having and experiencing junk food. Right. And I think it's really important. That's that's all marketing. As my, when my parents grew up in the fifties, right there really wasn't processed junk food out there at all. Like it just, it didn't really exist. It was just real whole foods and the whole, you know, junk food industry really hadn't begun until the sixties and seventies. So these weren't even options for most people. Um, my parents, for instance, didn't have that option. This is all newer stuff. So try to, if you're, if you're a parent today, like I'm challenged to say, I want to give my kids some fun experiences, but I want them to be healthy. So find the healthy substitutes out there. There are lots of good bloggers that specialize in this stuff and they have lots of good substitutes that will give your kid that feeling and that great, you know, atmosphere of being a kid and experiencing different things, but also having it be healthy. So have the health mindset first, make eating healthy for your kid a non-negotiable. 
okay? Like if we're gonna have pasta, for instance, guess what we're gonna do? We're gonna do miracle noodles that are glucomannan based, which is like a Japanese cognac yam, and it's zero calories, zero carbs, and we'll saute them in some ghee, and maybe add some coconut cream with it, and then we'll put in some grass-fed meat so we get some extra protein and maybe a side of some vegetables, right? So we can do healthy things and have those experiences, and not go without too. So just think like that. That now, sounds yeah. delicious. Do you get those miracle noodles? Do you order those or do you buy those locally? I get them on Amazon. Oh, do you? Okay. Yep. I and get them on good. Amazon. I love them. I saute them in some ghee for five minutes and then they're done. And then I'll cut up some. Do you um, have to cook them first? Do you cook the noodles like you boil them in water or something first? Or? No. I mean, for me, I strain them out with, with cold water and then I put some ghee on a, um, on a griddle. It's the pan. Uh -huh. And then I just saute them in there for three to five minutes and then serve them. And they're done. That's it. Done. And do they have different flavors or it's just miracle noodle and that's it? Well, I mean, there's not really flavors when it comes to noodles, but they have different types. They'll have angel hair, fettuccine. Okay. They'll even have um, miracle noodle rice too, which is great if you want a rice substitute. So I like that if you if you want that kind of pasta feel. I mean, I grew up in an Italian household where right. we pasta <laughs> a lot. And then it's kind of nice to have that. So and then we'll do the spaghetti squash as well, uh, sp spaghetti squash noodles. I love those. And then we'll also do the zucchini noodles. Those are great. That's great. But yeah. The miracle I, I, noodles really feel like noodles. I'm going to have to try them. I mean, typically we just do organic white rice maybe once a week in the pressure cooker. And I do really, really good with it. No issues, no skin rashes in the baby from the rice. So we do that once a week. But besides that, we don't do any, any grains. But it would be fun to have like a pasta alternative. So I may look into yeah. those. Yeah. And we got the pizza alternative and we got the That's pasta cool. alternative. That's, That's very cool. cool. Excellent. So getting back on your thing, gut health is really important. Now, why do kids have issues with their guts? Um, it's a combination of number one, what did the mom eat when she was pregnant, right? Was there pesticide exposure? Was there antibiotic exposure? Um, was there excess sugar and carbohydrate issues uh, when she was pregnant? That's number one. Uh, number two, what, was there a vaginal birth? Did you get some good vaginal um, bacteria activation with the birth? And then number three, what kind of exposure did the child have off the bat? Um, growing up, I only breastfed, I think, for the first like three or four months, and which my mom's like, oh, you only wanted to eat that long. I said, well, I sh a three or four months year old shouldn't get a choice. <laughs> you should have fed me for at least a year. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. I, my, got, I got zero, zero days uh, of breastfeeding. So yeah, so there you go. So I mean, you can be healthy, right? But um, obviously, we're healthy. But you know, there's a lot of research out there. The longer breastfeeding you have, uh, the better chance of health. My son, Aiden's 13 months and he's not gotten sick once. World Health Organization recommends 18 months, a year and a half. My son's at 13 months and he's doing well with that. But um, moral of the story is I was fed lots of dairy and grains in that first six months and I got lots of ear infections and the ear infections caused lots of antibiotics. I needed tubes eventually in my ears because of the oh. chronic ear infections. And I had ear infections into my even early teen years. Once I stopped gluten and conventional dairy, gone. Surprise. So something to do is this is this is the sequelae, right? Your kids are on gluten or dairy. They start getting ear infections. What happens? Antibiotics, antibiotics, antibiotics. Gut flora goes down, 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 down. Dysbiosis, yeast and fungal overgrowth. Yeast and fungal overgrowth perpetuates what? more refined sugar consumption because these critters produce chemicals to make you crave these refined carbohydrates. And the cycle goes on and on and on. The gut gets more leaky. And this is the kind of autoimmune, zonulin, leaky gut, food allergy, more zonulin, tight junctions open up, autoimmune conditions start to occur. So this is the pathology that we want to stop. This is like this pathological downward cycle. So we want to make sure, cut out the most allergenic foods, keep your kids healthy initially, and this is going to get you off this antibiotic exposure cascade. And then of course, you know, the pesticides and the roundup, the glyphosate all intensify this downward cycle. Yeah. Well, you brought up a great point about the autoimmune disease. The term juvenile rheumatoid arthritis did not exist until pretty recently. I don't know if this was a five-year-old term or three years old or 10 years old, but you used to not hear of such a thing as juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Now, they, the, when I say they, I'm guessing the FDA or whoever creates diseases so that they can then legally market a drug for them. They had to come up with the juvenile term because they were seeing that so many people younger and younger were getting rheumatoid arthritis. And that used to be something that quote unquote 
started to occur in your 40s or 50s, and now it's occurring in five-year-old, 10-year-old, 15-year-olds. They have no idea why. So what do they do? They just put the word juvenile in front of it. And But we know behind the scenes, it's the same mechanism. We know that, uh, for example, when we test uh, a lot of children and teenagers and adults as well, we test their guts. There's a there's an infection called Prevotella copri. If you just Google Prevotella rheumatoid arthritis, you're going to find that 75% of people who were newly diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, they actually have a Prevotella infection. And so we can't legally say cure, but what we can say is if you get rid of that infection, you could shut this autoimmune disease down. And there's a whole category of bacteria that Justin and I test on every single client. There's a whole category of potential autoimmune triggers, meaning if you have these bacterial overgrowth, you have stress, you have the zonulin elevated, which is taking those tight junctions and ripping them apart, you've got the potential to get an autoimmune disease. And those bacteria or parasites or worms or protozoa or the yeast that you mentioned from the antibiotics or the sugar, all those things add up and then all of a sudden the trigger on the gun gets pulled and then you got this autoimmune disease. So what our goal is as practitioners is let's try to prevent the disease from occurring. You know, why wait until somebody gets a diagnosis, then they're motivated. It's like, well, you should have been motivated before you got the diagnosis because it's much, much easier to get someone out of the rabbit hole before they enter the hole. 100%. Because it's not just one thing. It's that this one thing happens and it knocks over all these other dominoes that that push you more in this direction to the next, to the next, to the next. Kind of like the ear infection thing perpetuated the antibiotics which perpetuated the yeast overgrowth, which perpetuated more gluten and more dairy, which perpetuated the antibiotics. And then you're like, you know, five, eight, 10 years down the rabbit hole and you got a whole bunch of issues. So we want to educate parents and, you know, okay, what are these first dominoes that could fall and where could they go? So there's that. And I think the first intersection is, okay, we want that good bacterial stimulation at birth. So my wife had to have a C-section because of, um, she had a fibroid that was removed a while back that was on the bigger side. And based on our timeline, we, we couldn't use natural means because of how long it may take. So we had to have her fibroid removed. And once it's removed like that, most OBs are not going to allow a vaginal birth just because of the potential uterine rupture that can happen. So because of that, we had to do a C-section. Now, what do we do to help prevent that? We did a technique called vaginal seeding where we put a, a moist sterile um, medical kind of towel into her vaginal area about one to two hours before birth. So before she had the C-section, we had it in there with a little bit of saline solution to kind of sop up any of the bacterial flora. And then when the baby came out, it was good. I went over to the baby and I basically dabbed him everywhere, face, eyes, mouth, butt cheeks, genital, private area, armpits. He basically got exposed everywhere to that bacteria that he would have gotten in the vaginal canal. And so that kind of, that starts to activate that immune process and gets the immune system going. So if you aren't able to do a vaginal birth and, you know, I'm very holistic minded. I did everything I possibly could to make that happen. Happen. Um, I weighed out the risk and didn't want a uterine rupture. And even if it was a small percent chance, we went that way. Yeah. And this was the other kind of thing you could do. So if you can't do a vaginal birth, you can still get some of these immune benefits with vaginal seeding techniques. Well, it sounds like it worked because he hasn't gotten sick, knock on wood, and also yep. he's breastfed. So we know that he's getting tons of different immunoglobulins and all sorts of other good things from the milk too. And your wife's diet's dialed in too. So, I mean, I think you can circumnavigate some of the, the downfalls of that pretty easily. Yeah. On the breastfeeding side, it's really important. Most women don't understand that um, when a child's exposed to something, the bacteria or whatever they're being exposed to in their mouth hits the nipple. There's a two-way valve. So then the other side, the woman or the wife's going to, your, your mom, the baby's mom is going to start making antibodies that will go out in the breast milk. So a baby has some kind of immune stressor that hits here and the nipple goes in. The immune system goes to work on the mom's side and starts making antibodies that go back to the baby. So there's this wonderful two-way valve that's there. So when my son's in new environments, my wife's there like sopping it up, trying to get her immune system exposed so she can start going to work and making antibodies for him um, if he needs it. And he's not gotten sick. And then when she gets a little rundown, we have boosted her up with a little bit of adaptogens and um, we have used some medicinal mushrooms when she's a little bit more immunocompromised, higher dose vitamin C and some immune support called liver oil to kind of get her boosted up. You got to be careful with a child because you can't really give the, the child too much, but we give my wife some of the immune boosting support and then she can pass some of that down to the, to the baby.
Now, I think we talked about this before, but did you ever see that photo online? There was a woman who shared a picture of two different bags of breast milk that she had collected from herself. One was just a normal day of breast milk. And then the other, it was like a day or two after her child got sick, she collected breast milk and bagged it up. And the quote unquote, uh, sick day where the baby was sick, the mother's milk that day was so, so dark and yellow. It was almost as if it became super milk full of immune supporting benefits after she figured out her baby was sick. Yeah. I mean, this is why formula will never be able to compare because you'd have to have a laboratory where it's constantly being tweaked and designed. And then you have to, you have to essentially, um, add stem cells in and specific antibodies. I know people that have worked for, let's just say drug companies that have told me that the internal research that the drug companies have done, um, comparing breast milk to uh, formula don't even compare like oh, they God. cannot even come close now this is internal research so it doesn't right. get out there but i talk to people that on the inside that have done these type of you know internal research and they just say we, we can't even come close to it so i believe it if you have the ability to breastfeed um work it and do it as much as you can and hire a, a lactation consultant we had some issues to start with just because i think when you have a c-section there's some trauma that happens and that creates a stress response and then you can maybe on some pain drugs that could decrease your your flow. We were able to do it. It was really hard the first month, but it's the best gift you can give your child. So really don't don't take it for granted. It's it's important if you know what's coming out with stem cells and antibodies and the constant shift to what your child needs, it's very important. Yep. And let's fast forward to say five year olds, 10 year olds, 15 year olds, you know, school age children, you know, that may no longer be breastfeeding. Uh, I mean, I've had I've had a couple women breastfeeding their kids at five years old, you know, like once a day or, you know, once at night or something like that, you know, and I, I pass no judgment. Most society is going to judge people for that, but you see tribes that do it for a long, long time. But either way, wherever you are in that spectrum, however old the kid is, we see infections all the time in five-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 15-year-olds. I had a mom who brought two five-year-old twin boys to me. They were about to get kicked out of school because of their behavioral problems. And we tested both of the kids gut. And they had tons of parasites, man. They backed bacterial overgrowth. They had candida. They had all of it. And so we know, we talked about this before. We did a whole show on it. But with the Clostridia bacteria causing a buildup of dopamine because it messes up an enzyme in the gut. And all we did is we just made an herbal protocol to get rid of the infections in the gut. And the kids were able to take the capsules. Luckily, they knew how to swallow pills. And we'll talk about what you can do if you can't. But we got rid of the bugs and then the mom emailed me and she's like, what did you do to my kid? And I was like, whoa, what do you mean? And she was like, well, the kid can actually sit still. They were never able to sit still in their chair before for more than five minutes. And it was because we just calmed the gut down, which then calmed the brain down. Their behavioral problems disappeared and they didn't yeah. need your, your Ritalin or whatever pharmaceutical drug that a conventional doctor would have put them on. <sighs> totally. And when you're dealing with kids, it can be a little tough because I see it with my kid. They don't like to chew food up that well. <laughs> I'm not sure if you noticed this with, with your kids. They don't really chew really well. So one of the things, we haven't done it yet, but um, one of the things if we need to, you know, I have chewable enzymes that we'll use that taste kind of good and they're, they're very low in sugar, but that have really good enzymes in there that can be super helpful. So we'll give some enzymes if needed. We also give something at night to my son called gripe water, which basically has some herbs in there that help with digestion. It's got a little bit of ginger in there and some fennel which is really good kind of as a natural um, digestive that stimulates enzyme and acid production internally. So we do some of that. And then, you know, if we're having any motility issues, we'll give them some, some liposomal or some sublingual um, magnesium as well to kind of help with motility, just to keep things moving because kids intestinal tract, they don't have their parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system kind of dialed in yet. That's why they can't control uh, motility as well. So that really kind of keeps things moving because we don't want them getting backed up either. So enzymes are great. And then we'll also do some specific probiotics. The first couple of years, you know, three to four years of life, the Infantis strain is a really important strain of probiotics that um, kiddos need. And you may not see that in your typical adult um, base probiotic. There's the lactobacillus uh, rotatory. It begins with an R. I'll have to go look it up There's again. There's the rhamnosis one. Yes, that one, that one. So the lactobacillus rhamnosis is really important with the little guys. And so is the Infantis. So those are really good ones you want to look at. And then we'll have the good enzymes there as well. And then we can use some digestive kind of liquid compounds. I like gripe water. There's a couple other compounds that are great that really can help with the digestion, especially if your kid's not chewing food up well. 
Yep. So the enzymes can be great, but if you have infections, you have to clear those. So the question may become, well, how do you do it? Well, it depends on the the weight of the kid, first of all. So you always have to go based on weight. You're not going to give a full strength, you know, parasite killer for a 200 pound man for a 30 or 40 pound child. So you always got to make sure that you dose the herbs appropriately. Now, these things are really, really safe and compared to pharmaceutical drugs, but you still want to be smart with it. So we'll typically do like a quarter of an adult dose or a third of an adult dose of, of the herbs that we use. Yeah, kind of get the foundations dialed in. Also, when you're changing your kids' diapers, look at their stool. I noticed a whole bunch of blueberries in my 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 son's stool a month back. So we rotated things up. We started doing blackberries and raspberries and strawberries, and we kind of rotated. And if I saw some particulate that I could recognize more frequently, that was pulled out of the rotation for a week or two, and then we added back in. And we added back in. I look, and it would look relatively clean. So keep an eye on what you're noticing in the stool. That could be helpful. Enzymes can be great, probiotics can be great. And then the next thing is, well, when should we go to the next step? I think if your child still has symptoms or distress or behavioral issues, then I think looking deeper to the gut is gonna be that next step where Evan just mentioned, getting a comprehensive gut test. We like the GI MAP test as well, that's a great one. And we can look and see what that next step is. Yeah. So, I mean, if you've got a five-year-old or a 10-year-old, you're probably not going to get to see what their poops look like. Those kids are probably flushing the poop and they don't want you to look at it. They're embarrassed. So if you can't check out their poop, then you just have to take their word for it. And if they say they have stomach pain, then you got to investigate it. Like a lot of kids do, they'll report that to the parents, mommy, my tummy hurts and you got to get them tested. And I found two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, all with Giardia and crypto and H. pylori and bacterial overgrowth. So just because you're young doesn't mean, and just because you haven't traveled out of the U.S. does not mean that you're free from infection because you yeah. definitely could have stuff. And yeah, we saw pinworms. We saw pinworms yeah. in our daughter's stool. Yep. And we tried as many things as we could in terms of herbs to get rid of them. You know what the final straw was that helped us was the diatomaceous earth. And we only did it for yep. about four days. And we just did a tiny amount. We mixed it in with her other liquid tincture supplements. And we finally got rid of the pinworms. Those things were terrible. She was up all night. Her butt was itching. You could tell. Oh yeah, totally. And that could be a yeast issue. It could be a worm issue. It could be a parasite issue. Have your kids take a picture of their poop. I mean, I got patients emailing me pictures of their poop all the time. I am totally desensitized to it. I mean, you can just imagine like what my family talks about when we're totally desensitized about poop. You know, I had how, how are your BMs today? How's your gas doing? It's, it's all totally normal table talk. I had a guy who pooped out a three foot worm a couple of weeks ago. We upped wow. his dosage of the mimosa because he was starting to see small worms. And I thought, Hey, let's go a little higher. And we did. And I don't know how we confirmed three feet, but I'm going to believe him. Yeah, that's, that's quite a number for sure. So like for me, my son has no digestive issues right now. Am I going to do a gut test on him right now? Probably not. But in a few years, I will. Or if something comes up, um, I definitely will look at that. So I guess, you know, we kind of have to draw the line. We have all the functional support to help enhance digestion, support good bacteria, support gut lining integrity. And then we kind of have this line where we cross where maybe the symptoms aren't being resolved. And then we have to look at that next step. So I'm um, Evan, curious, how did you kind of draw that line with um, your daughter, Summer? Yeah, well said. That was exactly it. She wasn't sleeping well. Now, thank the Lord, she's sleeping through the night for the first time in two years, which is excellent because we finally got all of her her gut issues resolved. But it was when she was waking up five or six times a night. She was tossing and turning. We could tell that she was uncomfortable. It wasn't a normal cry like, I want milk. It was more of like, I'm an awake I'm awake right now. I'm in pain and I don't want to be awake, but I can't go back to sleep because of the pain. We could tell based on the sound of the cry that it wasn't normal. So that's when we got the stool test. We did see a few bacterial infections, bacterial overgrowth. And that's when we did some liquid, liquid tinctures. And it was like olive leaf and a little bit of uh, garlic, a little bit of oregano, some other liquids we did for like maybe three or four weeks, if that, and probiotics at the same time. And then we, we just cycled off of it. Very good points. And if you guys have any questions that's kind of germane to this topic, feel free and chime in. There's a couple here that are germane. So let me go over. SpectraCell can be a good way to look at some of the micronutrients. So we will go look at SpectraCell for some of the zinc and the vitamin A and some of the other things. I'll even look at an organics as well. SpectraCell is a um, blood test. So you got to be careful. I mean, you got to figure out if your kid's old enough to, to deal with a blood draw like that. So maybe I wait till like two or three for that test, maybe not when they're so young. Uh, organic acid test is a little bit easier, but I mean, you gotta collect the urine, so maybe a test that your kid has to be potty trained to, to, to be able to grab that initially.
And let me make um, a comment real quick. Yeah. So if people are listening to the podcast on iTunes, they're like, what is Justin doing? He's going on some crazy uh, different topic. Well, if you're following on Justin's YouTube channel, if you go on YouTube, type in Justin Health, and you can subscribe to the channel there, you'll see every time we go live like we're doing now, you're able to chime in and put questions on the YouTube video itself. So that's where these questions are coming from. Very good points. Yep, we are functional medicine on demand, totally non-rehearsed, raw, in the flesh. What you see is what you get. So that's the difference between us and most people here. Not very rehearsed at all. So hope you guys appreciate it. And then the last question was, um, do you give your kids flu shots? No, I do not. Um, flu shots are relatively ineffective. There's still a good deal of them that have about 25 micrograms of ethyl mercury in them as well. So that's not really good. I don't think there's any research where they've even tested them on little people yet, like, you know, one, two, three uh, years old. I think they have some of the research is on seven and eight year olds, but nothing on younger kiddos. And then with the mercury, I definitely would not. There's other medicinal mushrooms and things like vitamin D and things like vitamin C that we can give that actually enhance the immune system, the TH1 immune response. Remember, when you give a vaccine, you're just increasing the antibody the TH2 response. That's only one part of the immune system. Think of the TH1 part. That's the special forces. That's the that's the Navy SEALs, right? That's the Army Rangers. That's the that's the 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 Delta team, if you will. Those are the first responders. Think of the antibodies that come later. That's the infantry that lags behind. So my opinion personally is the TH1 immune response is really important because if you don't neutralize the invader coming in off the bat, that's the TH1. That's gonna be a lot of the herbs that we talked about and the nutrients we talked about, that's gonna be the TH1. So that's really important. And the vaccine does not touch that. There's actually some research showing that when you increase the TH2 response really, really high, you can actually drop the TH1 response and actually weaken those first line invaders because the TH2 and TH1 immune response work on a seesaw. So when you really jack up the TH2, you can really drop down that TH1. So that's some of the immune benefits that you get when you use some of the natural compounds. You can get those TH1 response up. Yeah, it makes perfect sense that even the Center for Disease Control came out and talked about how ineffective the flu vaccine was. And I think they said something like a 13 to 18 percent success rate, which is just terrible. Exactly. Yep. 100 percent. Now, some people ask what type of mushrooms I like. Reishi mushroom is really good. I think it's a, a really good product. For some of the kids, there's a great product by Designs for Health called Immunoberry, which is a nice little mushroom kind of immune support tincture. Uh, I like that as well. Uh, cod, liver, cod liver oil can also be great, especially if it has some extra vitamin A in it, which I like a lot. I have a product called Immuno Supreme, which has a lot of medicinal mushrooms and mono lauren in there. Uh, may not be good for super young kids, but you know, kids that can swallow pills, that's a really good product. Um, for as well. Anything else you wanted to highlight, Evan? Uh, they even have like the uh, monolaurin or the coconut extract in a powdered form where you could add a little bit to a kid's smoothie if you needed to. And then yep. there's also certain types of whey protein. There's a couple that we use. Uh, there's some that come from beef. And then there's actually a new one from Designs that I've been using that actually comes from the serum albumin. They call oh, yeah. it like an immunoglobulin concentrate. Yeah. That one's great. Yeah, I think they call it the IgG. That one's really good. So we use that a lot. And, you know, Justin and I have been beating the drum on mushrooms for years now. So we just love them. And we personally both do mushrooms all the time. Yep. And good adaptogens are great. And again, some people are asking about like, what should my one-year-old do? Well, number one, if your one-year-old is still breastfeeding, work on the mom, work yeah. on supporting her, um, some medicinal mushrooms. I don't like to go too high with certain things just because it's not that these things aren't safe with children or, you know, little, you know, young people at one or you're so years old, it's just, there's not research, right? Who's going to sign up their kid, their one-year-old for a study on this stuff. It's just not going to happen. Right. You know. So you're just kind of playing with fire. So we just try to be very conservative on our recommendations, support the mom, support her immune response. So then she can pass down all the really good antibodies to the younger one. But once they're, you know, two, three, four, and they can swallow things better, things better, then you can kind of go lower dose, you know, one quarter, to one third, maybe the adult, I'd say go one quarter of the adult dose. So if like the adult's able to do four or six capsules a day, you know, you start with a half a capsule twice a day with um, a child. And if it's a powder, you can always mix it in some um, applesauce. Or if we can find a good tincture that's mixed with a vegetable glycerin, we can always put that in a smoothie or like a sparkling water or something.
Yeah, I do want to uh, read this question and answer it here from Josh. He asked, do you have any thoughts on the validity of Restore or is it a scam? So the Restore, it's a product that Zach is Bush. created by Zach Bush. Yeah, he's a, he's a medical doc and it's mainly like a fulvic acid supplement. I believe it's coming from like some type of a volcanic rock extract something like that. But the goal of it is supposedly to eradicate glyphosate from the body as well as to fix a leaky gut situation by healing the tight junctions. So we actually measure that. We can measure the tight junctions. We can measure intestinal permeability. I've not had many people that have used it long enough to confirm whether it's legit or not, but I have had two women that I can think of specifically over the past month who were taking that product for over a year and we got their IgA levels back from their GI map stool test. The IgA is the mucosal barrier. Yep. And their IgA levels were less than 100. And the normal reference range that Justin and I use currently is 510 to 2010. We like to see the IgA around 1000, meaning the mucosal barrier is really in, in good shape. And both of these women were less than 100. Now, they did have infections, right? So they had parasites. They did have bacterial overgrowth. So the point may be, well, did the restore take them from a really terrible leaky gut, say a 50 IgA, to a 75, and it helped them heal up the gut a little bit? Or did it do nothing? Or was it that the infections were so bad that they were erasing the mucosal barrier no, how, no matter how much restore those women took? I don't know. I don't know the answer to it. Yeah, I think when we deal with like things in the third phase of the GI healing, so the six phases, our first ones are moving bad food, second ones replacing enzymes and acids, third ones repairing the gut lining and the adrenals and hormones. The repair is important, but it's not everything. If we haven't gotten the foods out, if we're not digesting the foods, you know, that those are linchpins and we have to have those dialed in first. And that may prevent, you know, imagine like you're getting chronically scraped all the time right? Because you're walking through thorn bushes all day, but you're just trying to put sov on it, but you're not getting to the root issue. Or let's say you're putting sov on it and you're not pulling the thorn out. Well, you have to, it, you need a, a program that's addressing the root cause, also pulling the thorn out as well. And there's other nutrients that are involved in healing the gut lining, glycine, yep. glutamine, DGL, aloe, other compounds, vitamin U, other nutrients that can be really helpful. So I see that as like one, you know, one tool in your tool belt, I'm not saying don't use it, but it would be something you want to work into a comprehensive program. And if I were to use it, that would work into the third R of my program. Yeah. And, and you make a great point too, which is that there's a correct order of operation. So if you just go straight to the silver bullet, the magic thing that's going to heal up your gut, but you didn't eradicate the infections that are causing the damage to the gut. We know Giardia, Crypto, H. Yep. pylori, you know, these things reduce stomach acid and enzyme levels. It causes excess rotting and putrefaction of the foods. Those undigested food molecules can also create a permeable gut barrier. So no matter how perfect the supplement may or may not be to heal the gut, if you've got these bad guys, you made an awesome analogy as always. If you if you haven't gotten rid of the bad guys, first of all, you've got to test for them. So first, get tested. Step two, if there's infections, fix them with the help of a practitioner. Then step three, and maybe then you're ready to move on to the healing phase. But man, if you're going to spend, I don't know, 60, 70 bucks a month on gut healing supplements, but you haven't tested and fixed the bugs first, you're kind of wasting your money. Yep, 100%. And I see another person here wrote in... Um, I already already addressed the cold remedy for a one year old. Um, we have another person, elderberry, okay for kids. I mean, depending on how old, if they're two or three, I think it's safe. We just want to use the correct dosing based on um, the, the the person's age, the person's age, the kid's age. I mean, I would look at the product and I'd make sure it's a product that's designed for uh, a child, and I would just dose it according to what they need. I know with the Immunoberry product, we just dose that according to the dose on the back, and that one is good for younger kiddos. So I like that one a lot. I have seen children specific. I believe the Gaia Professional line has a few specific elderberries for kids, and yep. it's it's a correct uh, extract ratio or a correct strength, rather. Yep, exactly. And then another person writes in about – um. Let me see here. Anything else I want to highlight? I want to keep it on point. A lot of questions are off point. Anything else you can see here, Evan, that you want to address? Yeah, we could hit this one. I mean, we did chat about gut health. So let's take this one from Josh here. He's asking about, can one have a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or a small intestinal fungal overgrowth and still test negative on three different breath tests, a lactulose breath test? I would say personally, I always jump to a good comprehensive stool test first Yep. because- 
Sometimes you can have SIBO or CIFO symptoms and have it be caused by a parasite or H. pylori or something else. Or sometimes there's just a dysbiotic overgrowth. It may not be necessarily coming from the small intestine. It may be coming more from the colon. So if you're doing a two-hour breath test, it may not come back on the breath test. So that's why we always tend to jump towards a comprehensive stool analysis first. And then once that's clear, if we still have symptoms, then we go to a breath test later. Yeah, we would still want to get the organic acid urine test as well because be yep. uh, candida does get missed quite often on the stool test because it's not the best way to find it. So we do look for the gases that come from the urine, and that way you can confirm whether you have a fungal overgrowth. And if you do, here's the great news. Justin and I have done this literally a thousand plus times, and we can get rid of this issue within four to six weeks as long as everything else is dialed in. So first you got to get the data, otherwise you're wasting your time and spending money on supplements you may or not need, may or may not need to fix these issues. Yeah, the organics is nice because of that. You can get a window into the bacterial stuff via urine, and again, it may not correlate all the time, but you can do you can see some markers like hipparate or benzoate or 2 hydroxyphenylacetate. These are all um, bacterial metabolite issues you'll see in the urine. We can see things like delactate in the urine. We can see things like dirabinitol in the urine, which are all metabolites of fungus as well. So Citric it's nice acid. to be able to see that. Citric acid goes up too, which is which has been linked to the yeast. Because sometimes it's weird. Sometimes the arabinose won't show up high, but then the citric acid or the carboxy citric acid or tartaric shows up. And it's like weird. Maybe this candida is not producing arabinose, but it's producing this and this and this instead. Do you do you ever see that? Yep, I do see that. I mean, on the GPL O test, you know, we'll also see the um, tartaric acid, like you mentioned. I think we'll also see the oxalates come up as well because those can go high with the yeast overgrowth too. That's right. Yeah. So Josh did give us a follow up here. He said that his fungal and bacterial markers were elevated on organic acid. So bingo, there you go. There you go. Bingo. That's why we like to have the organics kind of there in the background. It gives us that extra net to catch something in case you miss it. Yep. Awesome. Well, I think that was all the questions related to gut health. So I would just say to, to wrap up, you know, you talked a lot about mom's health, which is really important. So many moms and parents, and this is nothing against them. They just don't think about it. They don't think about themselves first. Right. They just think, Hey, something's wrong with my kid that I happen to be breastfeeding. The mom doesn't think I need to clean up my gluten and mm -hmm. dairy. I just cleaned up my kid. Why is my kid still having this eczema, even though he's gluten and dairy free, but yet I'm eating gluten and dairy every day for breakfast. And then I breastfeed him. It's like, you got to address the whole family. Yeah. There's a massive disconnect in society today that like what happens to the kid is their isolated kind of circumstance and whatever it is that has nothing to do with the mom. It has nothing to do with their diet. It has nothing to do with the kid's diet. There must be some kind of genetic thing going on here. And we have direct correlation with food, direct correlation with the mom's food, especially if they're still breastfeeding, um, all of those things. And also just, um, I see it a lot. I mean, I'm around a lot of moms too that feed their kids lots of sugary drinks or the drinks are sugar-free and they have aspartame or Splenda in there. Oh, and Splenda has three molecules of chlorine or chloride attached to it. And that can, there's research out of Duke showing that can affect gut microbiome and set them up for dysbiosis down the road. So remember, like the Splenda sugar-free stuff can really disrupt your gut and that's where 80 to 90% of your immune system is. Not to mention that you shouldn't be signaling to your kid, sweet, 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 every time they drink something. Oh man. We you don't want that a message happening. All right. We got to extend this podcast by yeah. one minute because sure. you just brought up, you brought up the word chlorine. I mean, I can't tell you how many kids go to swimming pools, whether indoor or outdoor swimming pools, they're breathing in and bathing in all that chlorine. And they have tons of issues with their gut from swallowing the chlorine. We know that even in tap water, if you don't filter out chlorine, we know that your tap water is contaminated. That can kill the good, the good guys that we're trying to build up in your child's gut as well. Yeah. And it's not even the chlorine. It's the chloramines that form from the chlorines. That That's even the bigger issue because it's even stronger. Like at my pool, we have a saltwater pool now that does have some chlorine, but it's very small. And I'm looking at putting a UV light in so we can even lessen the chlorine to begin with. Because if we don't have a little bit, you start getting algae and stuff growing in the pool too, which is like, you know, it's like, ah, you got this double-edged sword. So I'm trying to, to, to fret that out, but having a saltwater pool definitely helps. And then using the ultraviolet, if you can, can make it even better. I didn't know that. You're saying that even with saltwater, you still have to use something else. 
Well, what happens is when you put the salt water in there, the salt water through the ionization process, chlorines form as a byproduct from um, the, the salt water process. So there's natural chlorines that are made. It's when you have to add a whole bunch of chlorine to it, then you get this chloramine byproduct, which is stronger. Ah, got it, got it. We had one other question here from AOAT, and they were asking, what is the fastest way to get rid of a yeast overgrowth? I would say before you even worry about getting rid of it, you need to test and figure out what's going on because the protocol that Justin or I may design for you could be different depending on what's going on. For example, if you have parasites, that's going to be a big issue you have to fix. If you have bacterial infections, that's going to be a big issue. Candida is usually just along for the ride. It's just joining the party. We rarely see candida by itself. So that being said, we'd want to get you tested first because if you just take all these magic supplements to kill yeast, you're going to be one of the thousand plus people we've seen that say, hey, I took all these candida killer supplements and I still have candida. Why? And then what's the root cause? Like you just kind of alluded to. Number one, were you on antibiotics before and now you're having a rebound yeast overgrowth? Number two, um, is there an issue where you're just eating a whole bunch of refined sugar or, or kind of carbohydrates that are fueling it? Number three, are you exposing yourself to Roundup or various pesticides that could be creating a rebound overgrowth? Like what's the underlying issue? So Heavy we want to make sure. Too. Yeah, I mean, those are connected. So we want to get to what's the underlying issue. If we know what it is, and then we get you tested to make sure that's the only issue, then we can, we can prevent this cycle from repeating itself over and over again. Yeah, and this, I mean, this is the whole reason why our philosophy is test, don't guess, because if you don't test, then you're just going to go and buy something at Whole Foods, the supplement guy sold you, it's called Candida Buster or whatever, and you come home and you take it and you're like, okay, I maybe felt something, maybe not, and then you're not really inconsistent because you don't really know what you're going after, and then you stop taking it, and then eventually you just throw your arms up and you're like, okay, what do I do from here? Well, that's why you've got to figure it out. Or if your constitution's weaker and then all the, the dead toxins and debris and the acid aldehyde byproducts that are released from the fungal killing start making you sick, then it's like, well, now what do you do? Well, probably have to work more on the overall constitution before we dive into the killing, right? Very true. Very great point. Uh, we had one question here from Kay Gupta talking about chlorine and tap water. Can you recommend a good filter system? I've got the Pelican. They had really, really good reviews. I have the whole house system from Pelican. If you look up the reviews, they're stellar. And I just purchased new filters and I kind of put together a custom system because our city, unfortunately, does add fluoride to our water. So I did have to buy an extra fluoride filter to put onto the whole house. And then we use the Berkey shower filter. And then we use the Berkey for the countertop for like cooking and the drinking water. Good. So for me, I use the, I have two. I have a whole house water filtration through Aquasana, uh, justinhealth.com slash water to see the one I have. And then I use the Pelican countertop reverse osmosis for drinking and cooking. So that one's already been filtered twice, right? Once through the whole house and then once through the, the reverse osmosis. And then there's a, a post filter that adds some minerals back in. And then I also put a little jar of real salt um, on my kitchen countertop. So if we have water, we just add a dash of the extra minerals to the water. So then our water is super, super clean. Like the whole house because um, one, I could still drink out of it if I want to, it's still really clean. So if I'm upstairs and I don't wanna go downstairs, I can still you know grab a glass and drink out of my faucet in my bedroom. Or number two, the water that comes out of the shower hoses or shower faucets are really good too. So my showers are still super clean and I'm not spending you know, 50 to 100 bucks a year on each shower head in the house. Yep, yep, well said. There was a there was a a pitcher filter that a client had sent to me the other day. I can't remember it, but it was great for people that like were just on the go. I mean, it removed so many chemicals. It was almost as good as the Berkey, but it was a pitcher filter. Most pitchers like the Brita are absolutely terrible. They do most yeah. of nothing. And I would strongly recommend for you, Evan, um, to get, you know, get a good reverse osmosis countertop. I mean, the biggest problem I had with the Berkey, I still have a Berkey and I, I use it in case something were to happen. We can, you put rainwater in it. It's kind of my emergency thing in case like, you know, a hurricane, what was the one that just hit South Carolina? Yeah, Florence. Florence. Yeah, a hurricane Florence comes, I can at least take rainwater, run it through it, right? So I have that as my backup backup, but there would be days where like we forgot to put water in the Berkey the night before. And then it was like, Oh crap, we don't have water the next morning. Right? So I like the countertop because it's always got a gallon and a half and it's always at a gallon and a half. So if we use a half gallon, it starts filling up. So we never have to worry about that aspect of it. Yeah, I've got the, uh, I've got the quite a few filters in it. It goes pretty darn fast. 
Do you have the do you have a countertop one? I do, yeah. But when you've got four filters in there, that bad boy filters very fast. So if you have a countertop, you don't even you don't even need the Berkey then. No, no, no. I don't know. I'm sorry. I mean I have the Berkey on my countertop. I do not have oh. a I do not have a countertop filter though, but I do have the Aquatrue, and that's the one that is not connected to your countertop, but it is a countertop Close. system you can fit up there, and then that is RO, and that only takes maybe 30 seconds to do like two gallons. Okay, because mine, like the whole system underneath the sink, and then it's just a spout on top. Oh, so okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mob, and then it comes out. But it, they call it countertop, but it's really under the kitchen sink, and then yep. you have the spout on top. So. Here's the one. I'm not affiliated with these people. I probably should be an affiliate, but I'm not currently. But it, the company's called Clearly Filtered. You ought to check it out for yourself, Justin, too. It's it's clearly oh, this. Uh, clearlyfiltered.com. And this is the one that removes 99.9% .9 of lead, fluoride, pesticides, herbicides, et cetera. And it's all done with a pitcher. It's just one of those little generic looking pictures where cool. you put the water in and you pour it. So if you're like in a pinch and you only have $60 to spend, that's probably the one I'd get. Very cool. Yeah. And just remember anyone that, that we recommend a product, it's because we've actually used the product and like it and think it's great. So we only recommend things. So yeah, well, we may get a reimbursement or a commission off it, but we only choose ones that we like and use ourselves with our family. That's there's lots of options that are out there and we just choose what's best. And then you guys get the the advantage of um, getting our recommendations. Most of the time when we give recommendations too, we're giving links to people that give you somewhat of a discount, which is always good. Yep. That's the thing. We can work out with these companies and say, hey, you know, we like this. We're going to recommend it to our patients or our clients. And then they allow us to offer a discount as well, which is great. Yep. I've got nothing else to say on this topic. Do you before we wrap up? I think we hit it. I think just everyone listening, if you guys appreciate it, we love the thumbs up. We love the share. Sharing is caring. Um, give us some, um, hit the, you got hit the subscribe button, but also hit the bell right in the middle. The bell is what's going to allow you to get these notifications in the future. So you guys can be a part of these conversations. Yep. Well, if you want to reach out to schedule a consult with either of us, you can reach Justin at his site. It's justinhealth.com. You could schedule a consult there with him or his other doc on staff. And for me, you can reach out my site, evanbrand.com. And we look forward to helping you. Stay tuned and we'll talk with you again next week. And put your comments below. I'm trying to answer more of them during my free time. So put your comments below. Look forward to catching up with y'all and chatting with you later. Take care. Bye-bye. Evan, take care. Bye, y'all.